if we're taking lessons that we learned from the 2022 draft, I've got six of them for you, Keegan, okay? And the first lesson that I learned from the 2022 draft, round one wide receivers should always have your attention. Minimum of 35 targets, the 2022 class had five of the 29 guys who went over 1.75 yards per out run. Chris Olave, 2.42. Christian Watson, 2.26. Drake London, 2.07. Garrett Wilson, somehow, some way, with the corpse of Joe Flacco, Jets legend Mike White, Mike White, <laughs> Zach Wilson throwing him the rock. He averaged 1.85 yards per out run. And Traylon Burks, who, like again, was so up and down all over the place, 1.7 yards per out run. You look at Drake London, who had a 28% target share. Garrett Wilson had a 23% target share. Chris Olave had a 22% target share. You take in someone like Christian Watson, who isn't a first round pick. I'm kind of cheating, but he was one of the first picks of the second round. Yep. Watson averaged a 21% target share over his last like nine, 10 weeks of the year. And Burks was at 18% over his last 17 games. It's like these guys put up really solid fantasy production too. I think obviously Olave and Garrett Wilson and Christian Watson towards the end of the season were really elite. Like, Christian Watson to end the season in his last seven games was the wide receiver nine on a points per game basis. It was it, mm -hmm. insane, right? And I think what we can take from this is no matter what we think about these guys, like Jalen Hyatt is highly questionable as a prospect or Quentin Johnston ha clearly has flaws. Someone like Zay Flowers has questions. If these guys end up in the first round, these teams that are taking them have a plan for them, and I believe they will be fantasy relevant in redraft and obviously absolute slam dunk picks in dynasty formats. So yep, that's where I'm at. I may have questions on a prospect. I may be a little so-so, but if a team like trades up to draft them or if a team drafts them in the first round, I'm basically just all in because the past four years, that strategy has won you leagues. So uh, this is a weaker mm -hmm. class. Because it's so tiny, but Keegan, the 2022 class teaches me us anything is like, these guys are going to be used for a reason. Maybe they're not the alphas that those top three are in Alave, Wilson, and, and London, but even a role player like Christian Watson came out and absolutely dominated. So Keegan, I know that was a lot of words for me there. I got very <laughs> excited. I get very excited talking about this 2022 class. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, even somebody you might have a question marks on or somebody you think might be a role player, quote unquote, from this class. Are you buying their redraft stock? In like, I think even if they're think a first round pick. learned for me is like first round pick, like absolutely matters, right? Like you talked about all the guys that went in the first round last year, like an NFL GM and a team goes through combine, like goes through pro days, they see their season, the tape, and they still value them as a first round wide receiver, like. I am going to buy in on that receiver. But another lesson I learned like just from last year and last year could be maybe a bit of an outlier because there were some true alphas, but while landing spot matters, if in fantasy, it typically does, but if landing spot matters, what also matters to me is like, if it's a first round talent and like they grade him as a first round talent, it might not matter to me as much as I think it does. I think of somebody like a JSN who might not go to a team that were immediately like, Oh, you know, like he's going to be in a pass happy situation. But Jason is like the perfect type of player. He's, I think, the best wide receiver in this class coming up. He's going to be in the slot and he's going to get peppered with 100 plus targets on the year. It might end up with like 60 to 75 catches. You know, like that is something that I'm not even like focusing on his landing spot. It's like graded as a first round talent and combined with what I know about him and the position he plays like that to me is like really, really important. Like that's a lesson. I think of Olave Wilson in London and how they performed in awful quarterback situations and were still super fantasy relevant. I mean, you mentioned who Garrett Wilson was catching passes from. Chris Olave had two quarterbacks throughout the year. Drake London goes from Marcus Mariota with no throwing arm to a Desmond Ritter and still performs and had these massive target share numbers. So it's like, like you said, these first round talents that get graded as that, I'm going to buy into that. And I'm not even going to pay attention to their landing spot either because they have a plan, like you said, and they're going to fact them into their offense. It's almost like just blindly hit the draft button. It's like you might have questions about Quentin Johnston, but if someone takes him in the first round, you just draft him. Like it, these hit yeah, rates that's, are that's, really strong. They're just really strong. That's a really good one.
Because if you look at it from a re redraft perspective, like I think somebody like JSN, how I mentioned, like the position he plays, where he's going to line up, like what kind of wide receiver sets he's going to be in, that is somebody in redraft that I'm definitely trying to target, right? Like yeah, maybe a little bit of a rookie discount, like pick him somewhere in like the sixth, seventh round, like where London or Wilson were going last year. But in Quentin Johnson's case, somebody who's more of a like play on the outside, like a little bit more of like a bigger wide receiver mold, like not somebody who's going to be in the slot a lot, like that might have some questions. But both of these guys, if they're drafted in the first round in Dynasty, you're you want that. Absolutely. Like the teams have a plan. It's like it gets a little different for redraft versus Dynasty, but the first round grade definitely matters, especially more for Dynasty. Yeah. And I think another lesson too is stay patient. A lot of these guys that you draft and redraft in particular takes them like half the year and they have really strong back ends of the year. Like Wilson had a mm -hmm. really strong back end of the year. So did Drake London. Once Kyle Pitts went down and they made that change to Ritter, you know, Drake London was 15.5 you know, fantasy points, 12, 14, 10, and 18. Really solid for an offense that didn't throw a ton, for an offense that didn't score a ton of points. You saw Christian Watson explode on the back end of the season. And Traylon Burks was really good when he came back from injury too to close out the year. Yep. So I think the, the name of the game is these first round wide receivers, they're going to get used. Even like someone like Jahan Dotson was a first round guy that we haven't spoken about. Clear number two in an offense that wasn't that great. He's still pretty solid, man. Like he was a touchdown yep. machine, but he was really good. He was really he had a good. weird quarterback situation too, but yeah, yeah. He, he was still effective in his role, right? I had a note about that too. Like patience is really big for redraft, especially the post buy rookie bumps are a real, especially for these young wide receivers. Like if you are going to take a flyer on somebody like a London, like London's a great example. Like if you probably drafted London because it was draft capital in redraft. And you probably got tired of him because it's like, well, it's not popping up. Like it, it, you got to be patient. You have to take some time. Yeah. If you're taking a flyer on these guys in their later rounds, you have to go in with the intention of holding on to them and just being patient. You know, like not everybody's going to be a Christian Watson where you just don't have to draft him and you can pick him up in week 10 and then win a league. It's not always like that. Like sometimes if you do want to be in on these first round talents, you got to be patient with them in fantasy. Stay patient but they are great 7th, 8th, ninth round picks. High draft capital wide receivers have had a really strong hit rate. It's, it's magnificent, dude. Like, obviously, in Dynasty, if you drafted London, Wilson, like, again, no-brainer first-round picks. But in redraft, yeah. if you took Garrett Wilson, who got, like, no buzz this summer, like, he was the first receiver off the board, I didn't have Garrett Wilson on my radar. And then all of a sudden, I see this guy just destroying the Cleveland Browns. And I'm like, I've made, a, I've made a huge mistake. I've made a huge mistake not having this guy on my team. He wasn't drafted in a lot of leagues. It was, it was kind of crazy, dude. So yeah, I mean, that's just an example of like, keep these rookies on your radar. Regardless of situation, high draft capital, high draft capital, B lock oh, on these guys. Capital is B beating your ass. Capital. Tonight. High draft capital. High draft capital. Uh, be in on these guys. Like, their odds are if you draft two or three of them, one or two of them are going to hit and hit in a big way. Okay. Yeah. Continue. And here's, here's a little before we go to the next one for like on yeah. that note, here are some guys that are like being mocked to go in the first round. Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, no definitely a first round talent guy going to be mocked to there. Jordan Addison is a potential first-round guy. Uh, Quentin Johnson is a potential first-round guy. And then the fourth one, maybe somebody like Zay Flowers. But, like, those are Zay four Flowers. names right there that you should really be thinking about as, like, first-round talents and people that you're probably going to want to target. Yeah. Maybe Jalen Hyatt because of his speed in production. Jalen Hyatt might sneak in there, too. There could be five wide receivers that go in this first round, honestly. Maybe, maybe. Josh Downs is really good, too. I don't think he'd be a first-round pick, but... Like wide receiver needy teams like the Texans, the Bills, the Ravens. If, you know, DeAndre Hopkins gets traded, the Cardinals. There are a lot of interesting landing spots for these guys. The Titans, Jackson Smith and Jigba on the Titans with Traylon Burks. I mean, sign me up. That would be a ton of fun, man. So they're going to be great landing spots. I think Jackson Smith and Jigba, we'll talk about him 
a later date is the clear runaway favorite, I think, for having immediate impact in redraft. But yeah, don't sleep oh, yeah. on QJ. Don't sleep on Zay Flowers. For sure, don't sleep on Jordan Addison, who's smooth as hell out there. Okay, Keegan. So it's pretty clear. The 2022 draft taught us, one, prioritize round run wide receivers. Two, stay patient with them. If they don't pop in the first six, seven weeks, don't drop them. Don't panic. These guys are going to come on strong after usually their bye week, right? Mm -hmm. Another lesson that I think specifically is tailored to the 2022 draft. Because, you know, if you've been following the round one rookie wide receiver angle, it's worked quite well for you for the past four or five seasons, right? But an angle that I think is really interesting and something that I learned was just because you weren't featured in college doesn't mean you aren't good and doesn't mean you can't make an impact in the NFL. When I say that, Keegan, didn't really play in college, but came into the NFL and was immediately good from the 2022 draft. Whose name comes to mind? Oh, of course, Damian Pierce. Damian Pierce. Damian Pierce had phenomenal underlying metrics his last year in Florida. He was PFF's highest graded rusher. He forced 39 missed tackles. He averaged 3.7 yards per contact after attempt. But he only had 100 attempts, Keegan. 100 attempts. Uh, I guess the Florida Gators head coach was a real prick, I guess. I don't, I don't know <laughs> what was going on with that. But when I say that, right, running backs who weren't necessarily featured but had really good underlying metrics, are there any names from the 2023 draft that kind of ring a bell in terms of being the next Damian Pierce? I don't know if he'll be the next Damian Pierce, but one guy that I took in our running back draft is Roshan Johnson from Texas. Yes. And this is yes. like, I mean, not only does Texas have the luxury of having B. John Robinson, but they have a Roshan Johnson who's also part of their running back team and fits like the mold of a guy who can maybe be an every down back. I mean, he's a solid dude in the backfield and he just didn't get any run because he was behind the number one running back prospect. We don't know a ton of Roshan and what he's fully capable of. And it doesn't mean that he's not a good running back. There might be some NFL scouts that view him like as a really highly touted running back. And he's not going to have a lot of tread on his tires either. Um, he's a bit of a more of a question mark. I, I know, I think he had even less attempts than Damian Pierce did his last year at Florida. He did. Like 90 total. So, yeah. So just short of it, but it's like, that is some guy to me that sticks out. And I'm like, there could be something there. I'm not going to say like, it, that is a landing spot dependent opportunity for him, but there, that could be something down the line for a running. You've comped Roshan Johnson to James Connor, right? Like he's kind of built like that. He kind of has that size. Another comp that I've seen for Roshan Johnson is Chris Carson. So that is pretty solid territory both of those guys have been awesome in fantasy football if you look at Roshan Johnson's underlying metrics the guy averaged 5.8 yards per attempt he averaged over four yards per carry after contact I mean that's that's pretty damn good dude he forced a ton of missed tackles if you look at it on his 94 attempts he forced 44 missed tackles guys really solid Really strong pro comps, has the strong BMI, has really good underlying statistics. The only problem was is he played behind uh, B. John Robinson, and he wasn't going to get so a run playing behind B. John. We have a little bit of a question mark, yeah, because like with Damian Pierce's situation, it's like flashed when he had the ball. Roshan is probably harder to see. Like when you watch his highlights, it's, it looks great, like just from a running back perspective, but maybe it doesn't pop as much, but it's also because you just watch B. John have seven rush attempts that all look insane every time he touches the ball. And then you watch Roshan's and it's like not diluted, but in a way it is. And Damien like definitely popped on his tape, but Roshan's somebody who has an opportunity to come out and I think surprise some people. 32nd rated PFF rusher. Pretty solid for Roshan Johnson, considering the limited run he got. Another guy who didn't get a ton of run in college, who had a completely up and down collegiate career, but as somebody that draft analysts love, the tape heads love, and people who run a ton of like prospect models really like, and it, it's Zach Evans. So I know you hate Zach Evans. Every time I say his name, you, you like make a face 
like I told you, a relative of yours died. Uh, Evans had battled a ton of injuries, a ton of inconsistencies, but he averaged 6.5 yards per attempt. He averaged 3.5 yards after contact per attempt. He forced 35 missed tackles on 144 attempts. And, you know, he was the number two rated prospect in the country coming out of high school. Now he transferred from TCU, battled injuries, was never really the guy, which he probably should have. We want to see these guys dominate in college. But he profiles as someone who could be really good at the next level. I know you don't love him, but him and Roshan Johnson both could be candidates to be this year's Damian Pierce. Hate is a strong word, right? It's just like <laughs> there's a lot of good running backs in this class. And like when you look at them all compared to each other, it's hard to put Zach above somebody else. But the point remains the same. Like guys that maybe weren't so featured and like he bounced around in his college career between two different programs. Like you don't know much about him, but he could get to the next level and be kind of like a like an every down back. He kind of has that like profile to do that. And he's a really, really physical runner. So that could, that's another good get. I'm curious, outside of running backs, do you think a Damian Pierce could come from a different position? Okay, so hear me out, because I know I said that Zay Flowers might fall into a first-round draft pick, and yeah. that's totally okay. But from a different perspective, like just because the statistics aren't there, and I'm not saying Zay Flowers wasn't featured. He was by far and away the best receiver at Boston College. But just because the statistics and like the like blow your mind numbers aren't there does not mean that they won't be productive at the next level. Like if you watch Zay Flowers tape, it's a combination of like, holy shit, look what this guy can do with the ball in his hands. Or like, holy shit, look at that route. And it's also like a what the fuck throw is from his quarterback. It's like. It's really hard to watch, you know, right? It's like Zay Flowers is doing everything in his power to be this amazing wide receiver, but he has this lack of quarterback play. He only has one season, you know, played four years in college, has one season where he eclipses a thousand yards. And if you compare that to the JSNs, the Olaves, the any Ohio State wide receiver in the past couple of years, you look at that statistic and you're just like, that's a bit underwhelming. But just because a guy like that doesn't, have maybe the statistical stuff to back him up doesn't mean he's not going to be effective at the next level. Like, let's get Zay Flowers a good quarterback and see what the hell he can do with the football. <laughs> yeah, his quarterback situation was was garbanzo beans. I know you've it's, watched it's the tough. tape. I, I know you've it's seen tough. it. It's it's, it's a tough. pretty bad watch. You just see Zay Flowers looking like a baby Antonio Brown, just breaking people off uh, off his route, and then the quarterback just it's it's really sad. It's really frustrating yeah. to watch. It's it's like uh, it's like watching your Texas A and M Aggies with Devon A chain. I just I couldn't watch the tape after a while, dude. It was tough. Uh, that I think is an interesting candidate for Damian Pierce as a wide receiver is a wide receiver out of Tennessee that isn't Jalen Hyatt. It's Cedric Tillman. Are, are you familiar with Cedric Tillman? Um, or <laughs> Shaq meme? Are you familiar like, with his game? Slightly familiar with this game. Okay. okay. So Cedric Tillman in twenty twenty one. Goes over 1,000 yards, catches 12 touchdowns, was super solid in that Tennessee offense. 2022, 417 yards, three touchdowns. Definitely does not deliver on the fantastic season that he had previously. So you're looking at that and you're like, okay, usually you want to see these guys put up big numbers, but he has a game tailor-made to be really good in the NFL. And even though if some of his statistics underwhelmed in his senior season, I think the film, what he put on tape from his junior season, partnered with his size, his build, his athletic profile, could make him a sleeper pick to be highly productive in the NFL, even though he didn't really do much his senior season. He's 6'3", 213 pounds, ran a 4'5", 4 you have a lot of small guys in this draft and Cedric Tillman is someone who's a little bit bigger body someone kind of comp to like a Michael Gallup someone who could be really good in the NFL it's a name to watch too as a potential Damian Pierce type sleeper just because you didn't dominate in college doesn't mean you won't be really good at the next level and doesn't mean you won't immediately contribute and I think Damian Pierce could be an outlier but having someone like Zach Evans and Roshan Johnson in this draft 
could be really interesting. I think Zane Flowers is a great call out too, even though he might be a first round pick. And Cedric Tillman is somebody that you could definitely watch. Uh, another one that I wrote just for you because of this lesson is just kind of about one of your favorite players from last season. <laughs> this lesson is day three rookies. Those running backs can still smash, baby. Now it's which, it's a which little is tough. even more important yes. with this year, Sean. There's going to be yes. so many day three freaking yeah. running backs this year. So I D- think the chances of them smashing are higher, but also the chances of you missing could be higher. So it's it's tough. Day three running backs is like going to Marshalls, where you could spend an hour in Marshalls, and it's like, damn, I hate this store. There is nothing in here. And then you go over to the shoes and they just have like a really nice pair of Air Maxes for like no reason. They're in your size. Yeah, and they're like 25 bucks. Yeah, they're 25 bucks. And that's what Damian Pierce, Tyler Algier, and Isaiah Pacheco were last year. For for every like and one size 14 in lime green that you get at Marshall's, you're going to come across <laughs> a nice pair of Nike Air Maxes once in a while. And that's what Tyler Algier, Damian Pierce, and Isaiah Pacheco were. And you already hit it. This class is absolutely loaded with running backs. We've got all different types of profiles, scat backs, thumpers, speed guys. We've got guys that could be true workhorses. We have somebody who legally probably couldn't get on a roller coaster and do Vaughn. Like it is a <laughs> wide range of running backs. And you just know one of these guys is going to fall ass backwards into volume and is going to be super good. Like, yeah. Like names that we could throw out there, Dwayne McBride, who put up Wilt Chamberlain numbers over at UAB, University of Alabama, Birmingham. We have Sean Tucker, a highly debated prospect who's super athletic, who's had a weird up and down career at Syracuse, but is someone who could smash the NFL level. Eric Gray from Oklahoma, who looks like Aaron Jones. You've got Izzy Abanaconda. I think I said that right. Abanaconda? I think... I think I got it. I think I said Izzy Abinacada, who just ran a 4-3-4 unofficial at his pro day. He's somebody that looks like an Isaiah Pacheco clone. Like You've got all these different types of running backs. Deuce Vaughn, who I just mentioned, that could just absolutely smash, man. So like, I know that this is your moment to talk about Tyler Algier, who you just adore. (laughs) Um, I do love him. And and I, I just think like, There are tons of Algiers in this draft, which is cool. And Algier is somebody who still could be good and was solid as hell in redraft if you held on to him. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are your guys that are, you know, dynasty diamonds in the rough for sure too. Cause like if you're someone like me who traded away your high, uh, draft capital in this year's draft, there is, there's a lot. Yes. So Sean. There's a lot of running backs to go around. Like there's plenty of wealth to be found in the third and fourth rounds. And if you're in redraft, you know, like somebody like Tyler Algier, I took like on a flyer last year at the end of like the draft, just not knowing what that was going to be like. And he turns out to be like an amazing, like you said, stumbles into volume, you know, like there are so many other names you didn't even mention, like dude, Hank Bigsby and Tajay Spears, Tank. like where are they going to yes. go? Like, you know, and Sean Tucker is a perfect example. This is a guy who has the body to like fall into three down work depending on his landing spot and like maybe we don't think highly of him in college but he's just going to get in the nfl and eat and go for 950 yards at a couple touchdowns along the way and you're like wow i mean that was amazing youth is something in here that really really matters especially on the rbn like when you think of running backs like in their later years like the nfl has changed the landscape of like how they like run things are committee based like older yeah. guys are not getting the same amount of touches i mean the last time i think like a 30 plus year old running back like 300 plus carries was curtis martin in like 2004 or something like that. you know like wow that's like insane. really really far back like it's just changed so much so like the youth movement of running backs, like combined with like day three draft capital, is like a soft spot for some really good fantasy value. Look at the list of guys they're going to go day three. I bet you four of them are going to help you win a fantasy playoff matchup because of injuries, because they have youth movement, whatever it may be. Someone is going to be startable and they are going to be very good. Right. So oh my God. pay attention yeah. to these day three guys. Again, don't bank too much on it. On Dynasty, it's tough because day three guys are always 
looking over their shoulder because they're they're going to get replaced. You have to prove it year and year again. But for redraft, oh baby, sign me up. Gosh, baby. I'm like I'm like looking at these names. It's right? insane. Like, said, Deuce names Vaughn, insane. like Sean Tucker, Tajay Spears, <laughs> maybe even uh, Keaton Mitchell. You never know, <laughs> dude. Kendry Miller, like it's a way McBride. There is going to be like even Roshan Johnson is somebody that's going to be like in this third round yes. territory, right? Oh like, yeah, four fourth round and and above, like. It, you can pull up the whole list. It is such an impressive list of prospects like Chris Rodriguez, Mohamed Ibrahim, Roshan Johnson, Deuce Vaughn, Dwayne McBride, uh, Izzy Abanaconda, Kenny McIntosh, Kendra Miller, Chase Brown, Evan Hull, who's like a baby Christian McCaffrey to some people. Like there is every type of profile, flavor. And I think three or four of these guys if injuries occur are going to be league winners for you so pay attention isaiah pacheco Dan and tyler algier were three names that help people win playoff games that help people down the stretch and fantasy off of waivers that next crop is coming in this draft and it is a loaded running back class so always be on the lookout for day three rookie running backs because they can smash another lesson that i have here keegan is even the meh QB prospects have upside. And I don't think you were this starting to This is a Kenny dynasty Pickett. lesson here. Yeah, this is a dynasty lesson, right? Like, or, or a super flex lesson, right? Yes. Yeah, that, and, that, that plays too. Yeah, because you weren't starting Kenny Pickett or Desmond Ritter uh, or uh, my goat, Brock Purdy. Oh, you could have actually started Brock Purdy down the stretch. You, that's like the thing, though. You were the only you were, guy. People were starting him. Yeah, yeah that's the really the only guy you could start down the stretch out of this rookie class was was Brock Purdy. He was the best passer. Um, I think given his landing spot weapons and situation, it was set up pretty nicely for Brock Purdy to deliver. But you're going to have four guys from this really bad class probably start at some point next season in Sam Howell, Kenny Pickett, Desmond Ritter, and Brock Purdy. So that just tells you that even like four of these guys that no one's going to think are world beaters, they're going to get an opportunity to be good in year two. And they, they got some run at the end of year one. So if even meh prospects at the QB position can give you some startable games in redraft and, and give you opportunity in year two for dynasty and for super flex, like just imagine what good QB prospects are going to be able to do for you. Like Bryce Young, like Anthony Richardson. People are hating on Will Levis. Will Levis is so much fucking better than Hendon Hooker. But even Hendon Hooker, like who I think is a kids bop quarterback prospect because he's 25 and played in a fake offense. That offense was fake news. If an offense could be fake news. Keep an open mind about Hendon Hooker because he may land in a solid situation and he may not be asked to do much and he may be good. Like it, it's definitely a possibility. So even on these mad prospects, they have value in Superflex. And I think even in year two, they can be really strong. So I don't know how big of a help that is in redraft. We all know running quarterbacks can help when they're rookies. But Keegan, like even looking at a bad class in 2022, are there lessons that you can take for this class that we have in 2023? I don't know, because it's such a drastic difference between skill. Like the, the gap is, I mean... I don't want to say astronomical, but like comparing Bryce Young to Malik Willis is like, I mean, it's a giant. Pretty jump, tough, right? Like, Pretty tough. It's like fifth grade CJ reading Stroud. to fifth grade <laughs> reading to like 12th grade reading. It's, it's like, a pretty like go watch, go watch CJ Stroud, like, and then watch Kenny Pickett, and you're like, mm, but then it's still a pretty big gap. Like, it's, I don't know how much I learned from last year's crop of Met quarterbacks other than. You know, somebody like a Desmond Ritter, like that actually is a good example of a lesson we learned. Like somebody who was very polished in college, maybe didn't play at a big enough program. Like Cincinnati is getting bigger, but he was pretty polished coming out of college. And he got an opportunity to sit behind Mariota and actually start at the end of the year. And now he is going to get a chance to be the Falcon starter. Like, and Pickett will be a starter next year again. Like there is, there's something to be said for, paying attention to these quarterbacks, even if you don't love them. Like, maybe don't go take a flyer on Kellen Mond, like I thought about doing, 
Um, but oh no, uh, oh no, poor but, Kellen Mond. Yes, I know. Uh, but there is, I think, a wealth of quarterbacks, and if you are not positioned in dynasty to take one of the top four guys, like don't be upset about it. Like maybe maybe grab yourself a little hidden hooker. And yeah, put him on the taxi squad and and see what you can do because you never know. It might be a, a valuable contributor to your team. Like Desmond Ritter is going to be for somebody in Dynasty next year. But I don't. Sorry, it's hard to say. I have a lesson from these guys just because they're so different. They're like wildly different classes. Yeah, well, watch out for Dorian Thompson Robinson. He might be interesting. Watch out for we'll maybe a, a Clayton Tune. Wow. This is this is where we're going off the hinges here when we're doing Clayton yeah. Tune talk. But seriously, keep an open mind. I think that might be the the lesson here is keep an open mind on these quarterback prospects. They may surprise you. I think and this is that is a Will Levis tweet. Keep an open mind. People are way too down on Levis. I know he's your guy, but like he is such a better prospect than Hendon Hooker. Like, come on. Like, let's I stop tweeting like, clicks here. Yeah, I don't know. The Levis thing is is interesting for sure. But what do we what do we have here on the next lesson here, Sean? What? Oh, okay. I see where we're going next. I, dude, okay. This class for 2023, elite tight end class. You have Dalton Kincaid, who I won't say it. He has some shades of Travis Kelsey. You've got Darnell yep. Washington whose relative athletic score, his RAS score, is similar to Rob Gronkowski. You have Michael Mayer, who looks like a tight end out of the throwback Antonio Gates, Jason Witten mold, right? Like guys that are really, really good. And the reason I'm talking about this elite tight end class is because even when a tight end is elite as a rookie, it's still pretty ass for redraft. <laughs> it's still... uh it's it's still not great, but JJ Zacharyson was looking at this. He he has a tight end model, and he was looking at ninety percentile tight ends, right? So he he pulled from the last eleven years. There've been six tight ends that have hit this eighty percentile athletic score output model and ninetieth percentile, right? Ninetieth being super high. The three rookies that were able to achieve it at a ninetieth percentile were Pat Fryermuth, Kyle Pitts and Greg Dulcich. So Greg Dulcich last season as a rookie had an elite rookie tight end season and he scored 8.5 fantasy points per game. So this is elite usage, elite company, and he still only scored 8.5 fantasy points per game. Now he was quite usable as a tight end one for stretches during the season, Keegan, but like even elite rookie numbers from tight ends are ass. So I wouldn't expect yeah. much out of these rookie tight ends, man. I'm I'm looking for at redraft. a list from PFF. Yeah, I'm looking at a list of PFF like tight end statistics, like top tight end seasons of the last decade. And I mean, there's some really good tight end names in here, and they're just like atrocious seasons, like in terms of fantasy production. Not atrocious on the football field, but it is. I mean, some of these names on this list, like Hunter Henry. Average 6.33 points a game in his like rookie year. And he only had 40, 478 yards and eight touchdowns. And that was like one of the best rookie tight end seasons of like the last 20 years. You know, like Gronk is up there and he only averaged seven points. And Aaron Hernandez, redacted, averaged just under seven points a game as well. And that was like a really, really good rookie season, you know. There's not much for the tight ends in the redraft world that are rookies. You think of like Trey McBride last year, who is one of the better tight end prospects that coming out of college, and he just like doesn't get any run either. That's the other thing. It's not a position where people step in and like immediately get an opportunity to make an impact with their roster. It's like a long-term developmental one. And then you have late season bloomers like me and you, we're big Chig. We love Chig. We love Chig O'Connor. Out. I've got him in a dynasty roster as well, too. But it's like, that was only yeah. a couple weeks of fun, right? It's not like he got yeah. an entire season out of it. And there's obviously the outlier that is Kyle Pitts. But even then, it was... Even that wasn't that time. great. It was yeah. it was solid. He went over 1,000 yards, but he caught like... How many? He caught like one touchdown, right? One touchdown. One. Insane. Okay, so 
I think that tells us though that year two breakouts are really strong. Like Dulcich will probably be pretty damn good in year two. And it means Trey McBride will probably be pretty damn good in year two. Like yes, that, Jelani like Woods Kurtz too. Coming off um, an injury again and he's like older age. He has no yard after the catch ability. Like Trey McBride is going to be like a tight end that maybe you target in redraft like towards the end of your draft and maybe you didn't want to get Dude. one of the elite guys like that's somebody that you should be looking at. Dulcich with Sean Payton is pretty exciting. It's a pretty exciting combo. So again, Dalton Kincaid, Michael Mayer, Darnell Washington, you're going to fall in love with these guys during the pre-draft process. Their highlights are incredible. They're going to be good NFL players, but they're basically dead on arrival in redraft. Unless like a bunch of injuries happen and they land in the perfect situation, you're probably just going to have to wait for year two. But they are great picks in Dynasty. Like second round and, picks, they are awesome picks. And I think it also just has so much more to do with like the, how coaches like like to use their tight ends now. I mean, it's we saw Arthur Smith do this with Kyle Pitts. Yeah. Like Kyle Pitts was like fucking blocking, right? Like, and he he's more wide receiver than he is a tight end. I think somebody out of this class that might actually have success in year one because he does everything so well is Michael Mayer. Like he He's will get so to, he will get to a team and they're going to fall in love with him because he will do all of that nasty work that maybe people aren't willing to do on day one. And he's not going to complain. He's just going to go in there and grind it out. And because of that, he will get an opportunity to be featured in the past game. You know, I'm not saying Arthur Smith had to like tell Kyle Pitts, like you have to earn your way. That's just like how coaches want to, you to be like tight ends are still effectively an extension of the offensive line. So it gets really hard for them to just enter into a team and break out as a viable receiving threat. That is unless you're just in a pass for unless you're like in a pass first offense, right? Where like I hope Dalton Kincaid goes to a pass first offense and they don't ask him to block, right? But oh my god, Michael yeah. Mayer. Like that would be a nightmare if Kincaid had to go like to like oh God. Like if he was like in the Falcons last year, you know, like it Yes. Where like oh, Arthur Smith admitted that he just should go get Johnny Smith to go block and then Kyle Pitts could be a wide receiver. So like that that seems that, like a good move now for your three. Me. Yep, exactly. Uh, but dude, Mayor on the Cowboys would be sick. Ooh. Replace Dalton Schultz or or Kincaid. I think that's my favorite tight end landing spot uh for the rookies. Cause Dak loves his tight ends. Dalton Schultz got force fed. Dalton Schultz is fine. Like he's poor man Zach Ertz, which is, is telling you something. Imagine if you got someone who could break some tackles, had a little wiggle. That'd be really fun. That's like my ideal spot. Michael Merrick, Dalton Kincaid would love to see them be a cowboy. Um, here's here's a landing spot for you. Um, let's let's get somebody to replace Gerald Everett out of those two on the Chargers. Let let's get a little mini Kelsey Kincaid to the Chargers. Yeah, I think those are two of like the better tight end landing spots. I think Green Bay is is a fun one too. If you wanted to plop one of these guys in Green Bay with Christian Watson, that's a fun combo. I like. I that. really like that. I wonder where uh, Washington's going to go because he is not the other two by any means in terms of steady production and tape, but he is an athlete. A, and he's a blocker. Uh, he's basically a left tackle. He has to, he's, <laughs> he's, he's insane, dude. Yep. He's insane. I, I think uh, he'd be fun on like a team that wants to run the ball. He'd be like, imagine if he's like a Niner. He'd be so sick. If he was like a 49er, that would fit so well for what, what they're trying to do. Because again, Kittle would soak up all the targets, but like Washington would be a freak as like a secondary blocker. Man. This tight end class is electric. And I just want to recommend drafting these guys, but you're going to have to wait. It's just the rules. That's, that's what 2022 taught us. And that's what 2021 taught us outside of Kyle Pitts because he's an anomaly. Yep. Um, before we get out of here, the, the last lesson that I have, and I think this is just about keeping an open mind, which has been a lot of this podcast, is maybe if I see a prospect and I'm poking holes in their game, like they can't do this, they can't do that. Well, well, are they going to do this, that? Well, whatever. But they do one thing super elite, like Rashad White, elite pass catcher was elite in college, was very good in the pros as a rookie. Christian Watson. Is he like a nuanced wide receiver? <laughs> no, but how fast and how big is Christian Watson? Does yep. that speed and that trait translate? So I think for me, is keeping an open mind if some prospect does something truly elite. And, and for me, it's Jalen Hyatt. I know this offense 
I've called it fake news. I've called it a kid's bop offense. I've called it a Chuck E. Cheese candy ass offense, right? It, it is an offense where they line up everyone on the hashes. They put him behind another wide receiver so he can't get pressed. And it's just off to the races. But at some point or another, when you're watching the film on Jalen Hyatt, there is no one around him. He is on an island of separation, right? I don't care if it's scheme or skill. To have that kind of separation all day, every day is truly elite. And I'm just going to have to keep in mind on Jalen Hyatt, even though he might be a role player, but he could be Will Fuller 2.0, man. And I have to keep an open mind on this guy, regardless if maybe he's not a nuanced route runner or he's not a contested catch specialist or if he doesn't want to catch the ball over the middle, like all these things that people are throwing out against him. I got to throw that out when that guy's literally always open. So I just got to keep an open mind on Hyatt because he's just so elite. Mm -hmm. like in terms of getting separation that's a good one yeah i like that it's like i'll go ahead and back my guy here but devon a chain is people are gonna and and this is a little weird because people are they know he's fast i mean he's got otherworldly track speed but that's all they think like and that's a good problem to have as a running back to be super fast right but people who didn't watch a and m or aren't gonna watch tape on devon a chain they're gonna see the combine scores they're gonna look at his size and his weight and they're not going to realize how effective he is between the tackles as a runner and like where he's doing his damage in the backfield and how often he's basically running through every gap and, you know, and how effective he was as a true running back. People are going to look at him as like a gadget guy in the NFL, but get him on an offense with a good offensive line and see, see what he can do. I think a really obvious one too is Deuce Vaughn. I am yeah. interested. His Can... metrics are insane. His his underlying metrics, all the nerd stats say that this guy was one of the best running backs in the country, and he's 5'5". Five five. I don't know what to do here. What if we gave him 10 to 12 touches? Let's see what happens in the NFL. Let's see what Deuce could do. But that's another one. Like, he's so tiny, man. But, like, Deuce is special. Like, he's special. Like, I don't know. It's tough. It's weird it's because guy. you watch him and... At some point, you forget how small he is because of how competitive the runs are and how explosive some of those plays look and how important he was to the team. You're just like, this guy's really good. And you're like, wait a minute. He's like, he gets mad because when he sits on the curb, his feet dangle. (laughs) Dude, it's like you look at his highlight tape and it's like you're expecting him to like be breaking off big runs against like Iowa State. And it's just like Bama. It's just house call. Like it's it's crazy, dude. Like he's fearless and he's nasty. Like oh, I don't know. I just got to keep an open mind on these guys, man. That's a good call out. All right, Keegan. These are our lessons learned from the 2022 draft. Right, round one wide receivers. They should always have your attention. Just because you weren't featured in college doesn't mean you aren't good and can't make an impact. Day three rookies can still smash. It's it's like shopping at Marshall's, but they can still smash. You can still come up. Lesson four, even the meh QB prospects are going to have some fantasy upside. Even elite rookie tight ends are still kind of ass. If a prospect has a truly elite trade on film and it's backed up by the underlying metrics, you got to keep an open mind. So those are our six. Keegan, before we get out of here, do you have anything else you'd like to tell the listeners? Uh, uh, um. Man, not really. I I got nothing to thank you everybody for tuning in, Keegan. Thank you for coming back. We missed you, man. Thank you, Aiden, for filling in last week. We have a great episode planned for next week with a special guest. We are pumped. We're gonna be drafting the pass catchers in the 2023 draft. It is gonna be a great time. If you are still listening, come on, go touch some grass. Go hang out with some loved ones. We're gonna be here all year round prepping you for the 2023 NFL draft and then gearing you up for, for fantasy football drafts in August, man. So this is going to be a ton of fun. Keegan, thank you for always joining and thank you everybody for tuning in.